From inside the warehouse at Oriole Park at Camden Yards, it is the Masson All Access Podcast. Paul Mancano, Brendan Mortensen here with you. Thrilling, exciting day here in the warehouse, Brendan. So much to get to. Really exciting news that just came through. And I'm so glad that we can share it all with you right here, right now. And uh, without further ado, I think we should just roll the clip. Yeah, I know what you're setting up, and it's just it's just not what it should be. And the debate is finally over. It's not. And this is the news we've all been waiting for. Leads the greatest debate in America of pancakes or waffles. I don't think we have any hard opinions in this booth. That is not the greatest debate in America. Look. That's completely one-sided. We have a man named Cake City. Yeah, it's all us. pancakes. <laughs> Who would could, pick waffles could, I, over pancakes? I, I, I could use a waffle. What kind right of now. monster would go waffles over pancakes? John Gray is that monster. You no, know, he's down there, and he's I'm up here. Thankfully, the booth is very <laughs> high up. <laughs> That's right, everyone. The pancakes versus waffle debate has been closed. No, it hasn't. Kevin Brown and Jim Cakes Palmer have officially sided with pancakes. And frankly, scoffed at the idea that anyone would consider waffles a superior food. <sighs> Look, they're entitled to their opinions. Brendan. I mean, Jim Palmer, of course, with the nickname Cakes, I mean, you, you had to know which side of the There's, debate Jim Palmer was going to fall on there. That was a uh, given. Yeah, that's fair. In the pancake waffle debate. Kevin Brown has many wonderful opinions. This is just not one I agree with. I, I think that he's absolutely correct. And I think that... Uh, Honestly, he, he, his, he put his thumb on the scale, and uh, that's all I consider. I think the debate is over, That's Brendan. all you consider is Kevin Brown's opinion on pancakes or waffles. I think the, the fact that he didn't even give it a second thought, he said, what kind of monster? Sure. Monster. He used the word monster, he did. Brendan. Yeah. Would ever consider it consider waffles a superior food. I mean, I, I think that tells you everything you need to know. The debate is over. Uh, and, it's uh, certainly not. That closes the chapter on one of the Masson, Masson All Access podcasts. Largest and longest standing debates. Nope. Pancakes Doesn't. versus waffles, and pancakes takes home the victory. I completely disagree. Brendan, let's get to the biggest and more important news here. Why we're not on the couch? Yes. We're in the studio. The Mass and Web studio. Yeah. There were other people in that room. We had to use this room. There were. That was the whole story. That's it. Grayson Rodriguez has been recalled from AAA Norfolk and be, will be making his major league debut Today, in his home state of Texas, against the Rangers. Brendan got this news late last night, and boy, were we surprised yeah. when this came across our Twitter feeds. Well, first off, the last time that we were on this podcast, we were surprised that Grayson Rodriguez didn't crack the Orioles' opening day roster, was not going to be a part of the Orioles' opening day starting rotation. We thought, going into the year that Grayson would be making his debut in this Texas series as the Orioles' probable number five starter. Now he becomes the Orioles' essential number six starter, gets the start in today's game in the same scenario that we thought would happen, but in a very, very different way. It's certainly surprising, given the timeline of events that went down. When Grayson Rodriguez did not make the, the team out of camp, I think we all assumed that it was going to be a while before we were going to see him again. And we assumed that if the Orioles needed a short-term replacement for one of their starters because of injury, that they were going to go with a more experienced arm, somebody like Spencer Watkins or somebody like Austin Voth, who was already in their bullpen, who we'd seen start games at the big league level before. Michael Elias said when Grayson Rodriguez didn't make the team that there were several things that Grayson needed to work on down in AAA and that they were hoping to get a better version of him in spring training. I don't know if that better version showed up in the one AAA start that he made down in Norfolk. Well, I would just wager to say it didn't. I mean, I don't even know if it's, it's really up for debate. He goes four innings, three runs, two of them earned two strikeouts and four walks in his only start in AAA Norfolk. And uh, on this podcast last week, I was noted as really not being all that concerned about Grayson Rodriguez's spring training numbers. I wasn't all that concerned about the walks. We've never seen him have those sort of command issues in the past. I tended to think it was more of a fluky thing that Grayson Rodriguez would work out in no time. It didn't 
seemed to work itself out in his first start at AAA Norfolk. And you can look at that start differently than you looked at his starts in spring training. Because in spring training, like we said before, maybe you're tweaking mechanics. Maybe you're doing some things differently with, with hand placement, with balance, whatever it may be. But as soon as Grayson Rodriguez gets back down to AAA Norfolk, his goal is just to pitch as well as possible, put up the best numbers possible, so that he can get back up to the majors. And his first start in AAA this year was not indicative of the type of pitcher that Grayson Rodriguez can be. Yeah, he really struggled. It wasn't just the numbers from that start. I mean, watching some of the the film from that game, it was a lot of hard contact. Even some of the outs that he was able to record came on long fly balls. A lot of long counts, which goes into his number of walks in that start. It was a very non-Grayson-like start that we saw in AAA Norfolk. And if he was hoping to be banging down the door and to be showing Mike Elias in the front office that he did deserve a spot out of camp. He didn't do it in that first start. But the Orioles need somebody right now. I mean, Kyle Bradish, after he got drilled by that comebacker a couple days ago, 104 miles an hour off his right foot, yeah. tried to throw a warm-up pitch, landed funny, clearly wasn't comfortable, and he will head to the IL. The Orioles, according to Rockabaco, seem confident that it will be a short IL stint, and they're hoping that they can maybe get him back after the 15 days, which is necessary for a pitcher. But they need somebody for more than one start right now. And now it's up to Grayson Rodriguez to show at the big league level that he did deserve a spot out of camp, that he did deserve to be that fifth starter instead of Tyler Wells. Now, Tyler Wells proved the Orioles correct in his first appearance of the season, not even a start. Tyler Wells came out of the bullpen to relieve Kyle Bradish when Bradish got hit by that comebacker and pitched five no-hit innings, no walks, the only base runner reached on an error. Tyler Wells was awesome in his first start. The Orioles look vindicated for picking Tyler Wells there, and especially after Grayson Rodriguez struggled. But now it's just funny that both Tyler Wells and Grayson Rodriguez will be in this rotation. But Brendan, I I have to think that the reason that the Orioles went with Grayson Rodriguez here is because they're going to need more than one start out of whomever they were going to bring up to replace Kyle Bradish because Bradish going on the IL meant the Orioles were going to have to cover at least two starts, maybe three starts there. And I think they felt more confident in Grayson Rodriguez covering two or three starts there than they would Spencer Watkins, than they would Austin Voth. Yeah, I think this all but confirms the fact that the fifth spot in the starting rotation was down to Tyler Wells and Grayson Rodriguez. Yeah, I mean, Elias has pretty much said as much, we didn't know the specifics of it. You know, it was possible that maybe Spencer Watkins was in consideration for that fifth spot as well, but it seemed like the number five spot came down to those two guys specifically, and the Orioles clearly believe that if Tyler Wells was 5A, then Grayson Rodriguez was 5B. It's an interesting case here, though, Paul, because it opens up a whole bunch of questions for down the line. We're going to talk more about this specific start and what we expect from Grayson if he makes a start or two here in the big league so far. But with Grayson Rodriguez, you're not talking about somebody that you can just call up for a spot start. You're not even really talking about somebody like D.L. Hall, who is still a top 100 prospect, but you had a little bit more flexibility of moving him from the starting rotation into the bullpen. This is Grayson Rodriguez. This is the best pitching prospect in your system, arguably the best pitching prospect in all of baseball, consistently a top 10 prospect in baseball. I don't think you can call Grayson Rodriguez up and say, this is a spot start. You can't do to Grayson Rodriguez what you did to D.L. Hall last year, which was, okay, we'll give you a start against the Rays, and then we're going to try you in the bullpen, and then we'll send you back down, get you ramped up for the bullpen, and then you'll come back up, and then maybe next year we'll make you a starter. Those two guys are still your two best pitching prospects, but Grayson Rodriguez is in a different tier. He is. This may be simplistic, but why why can't they do that, Brendan? Because, I mean, it's kind of a simplistic answer in my mind, which is just that it's Grayson Rodriguez. Once he is up in the majors, he needs to be getting starts every five days. And if Kyle Bradish, the Orioles, as you mentioned, Rockabaca reporting that the Orioles are confident that Kyle Bradish will be able to make his return 
pretty much as soon as he is eligible to come off the 15-day injured list, which would set Grayson Rodriguez up for two, maybe three starts here. So if Kyle Bradish returns after three Grayson Rodriguez starts, are you going to send him back down to AAA? I mean, maybe if he really struggles, you can evaluate that a little bit more. But if Grayson Rodriguez has three starts where he looks like the Grayson Rodriguez we thought he could be at the big league level, then what do you do? Well, I think that, then that's a problem the Orioles would be happy to have because then that sure. means that Grayson Rodriguez has fixed, corrected all the issues that he may have shown in spring training, and you'll make room for Grayson Rodriguez. But I think the, the goal of what the Orioles are doing right now has changed. I think we're having a very different conversation right now than we would be at this time last year when talking about any top prospect. I think Adley Rutschman is one of a kind. I think Adley, Grayson Rodriguez, yes, is the Orioles' top pitching prospect. Yes, he's the number seven prospect in all of baseball. Adley was one. Adley was a 1-1 pick. He was taken by this regime. He was expected to be a superstar out of the gate. But Grayson is closer to the... Adley Rutschman, Gunnar Henderson tier than he is to the DL Hall tier of how you treat a prospect once he gets called up. I would agree, but I think the Orioles' goal right now still remains to win baseball games. Sure, and absolutely. It, they have always, over the last four years, since Michael Elias took over in November 2018, they have prioritized development of prospects, and then they won 83 games last year, and that changed. And Michael Elias said as much when they sent Grayson Rodriguez down to AAA to start the season, he said, we're not in the mode of just giving a guy a spot simply because of his prospect status. And I don't think they should be. I mean, it, you clear the deck for Adley Rutschman, yes, but also that was at a different time. I mean, the Orioles were 10 games below 500 or around that spot last year in mid-May when they made that call. And Adley Rutschman did deserve that call and did deserve to be the everyday catcher. And there wasn't somebody ahead of him on the depth chart. I mean, Robinson Chirinos was not having a great season and did in, ended up not having a great season. There wasn't somebody directly in front of him on the depth chart. Right now, the Orioles are trying to win as many games as possible. And we've said they have to win as many games as possible in order to sneak into the playoffs because they're not going to win the AL East. They're not going to beat out the Yankees or maybe even the Rays uh, or the Blue Jays. They have to get in in a wild card spot. And I think this move is predicated almost entirely on how good they believe Grayson Rodriguez can be in this start today and how good he can be while Kyle Bradish is waiting to come back. Yeah, absolutely. You're in win-now mode. And the Orioles clearly believe that Grayson Rodriguez gives you a better chance to win baseball games right now than Spencer Watkins, who would have started this game on short rest, or somebody else that you yeah. would have had to call up from AAA, whether it was Drew Rahm or somebody on a, some short rest. I, I will say also I saw a comment that said that Watkins could not start this game because he started on April 2nd. Yeah. So it would be short start, short rest, rather, for Watkins. But you also could have gone with some kind of Austin Voth, Keegan yes. Aiken bullpen game today. You could have figured it out without calling up Grayson yes. Rodriguez. Yes, and then brought up Spencer Watkins to start later, you know, when they come back home for right. the, the homestand. This is a, a move that they believe Grayson is better than Watkins right now. Yeah, and like you said, this is another conversation that we are going to be having Two weeks down the line, because hopefully Grayson Rodriguez has two or three starts where he absolutely shoves and proves that he is supposed to be in this starting rotation in the big leagues. His play is going to predicate whether or not he is going to continue to get a spot every five days. I, I don't think, I, and at least I don't hope, that there will be a scenario where Grayson Rodriguez has two or three fantastic outings and then the Orioles go, okay, that was great. We'll see you in AAA. I, I don't think they would. Because then there, then he will have made the necessary adjustments, right? Right. right. Then and he they, has nothing left to prove at AAA. No. And if he's shoving at the big league level, absolutely. I, I think you make room for him. I don't know how you do it. Maybe you move. Yeah, that's the question. How do you do it? Right. Because if Tyler Wells continues to throw as many great innings as he threw a few days ago, then you're just kind of... It's a good problem to have. I get of that Where question. do you fit Grayson Rodriguez, but... I get that question all the time. People ask, how do you do it, Paul? And I say, it's a mystery. It's all in the secret sauce, Brendan. Sure. That happens all the time. I think at that point, you reevaluate. Yeah. And right now, the Orioles have gotten, it, where it's an incredibly small sample size, they've gotten some uneven performances from their starting pitching. I mean, 
Kyle Gibson really struggled on opening day, but then had a great bounce back start last night. Dean Kramer really struggled in his first start in Boston. If those struggles continue, maybe he takes Dean Kramer's spot in the rotation. But the the first box that needs to be checked is Grayson Rodriguez being good. Yeah. I mean, he cannot struggle. And if he does struggle, and there's evidence that he might, considering how much he struggled in his first Norfolk start of the year, if he does struggle, then I do think you will have to send him back down. And I don't think it'll be all that controversial because if he's not helping you win games, and he already showed that he struggled at AAA in his first start, a little more seasoning in AAA might be what he needs. Yeah. I mean, it, you you only have to, ha- you have to have a pretty short leash with all these guys right now. I mean, Adley, Gunner, you're going to keep them up for the entirety of the season. But if even guys like Terran Vavra or Ryan McKenna struggle, you just can't sit on your hands and hope that they figure it out because they're young guys and they were former top prospects. You have to win baseball games right now. And even Kyle Stowers fits into that category too. We've seen the Orioles, they slow played Stowers because yes, they want to see Stowers develop, but they want to win baseball games. Right. And they felt like other guys gave them a better chance of winning those first couple games than Kyle Stowers did. Yeah, and this is not a spot that I thought we'd be in discussing Grayson Rodriguez. I think you and I both went into spring training assuming that Grayrod would put up great numbers in spring training, yeah. that he would prove that he was one of the five best starters in this organization, and he would hold down the Orioles' number five rotation spot. And even if he struggled a bit here and there in his first two or three starts in the big leagues, like every rookie pitcher does, he would figure it out as the season went along. And maybe once we got to the second half of the season, we would see a great form of Grayson Rodriguez, and he would be one of the best starting pitchers on this team. This is a really interesting spot to be discussing Grayson Rodriguez right now because you're looking at what could potentially only be a two or three game sample size until Kyle Bradish gets back where we have to determine, Michael Elias has to determine if Grayson Rodriguez is worthy of staying in the starting rotation or not. Yeah. If he is better than somebody that you would have to bump, whether it's Dean Kramer or Tyler Wells. That's going to be really, really hard for a rookie pitcher to do, to come out in his first two or three starts at the big league level and shove to the point where Michael Elias and Brandon Hyde say, we have to move somebody out of the starting rotation to make room for this guy. That's a really difficult position for Grayson Rodriguez to be in, especially considering his spring training numbers weren't very good and his first start at AAA Norfolk this year was not very good. So that's him digging his own hole then. Absolutely. I'm I mean, just saying yeah. it's a it's a weird it's, conversation for us to be having right now, given where we thought we would be with Grayson Rodriguez a month ago. But at the same time, I think a lot of prospects, so many players get one shot. Grace, this is not going to be Grayson Rodriguez's only shot. Right. He is a top pitching prospect in baseball. He's a top prospect in baseball. If he comes up and makes two or three starts and struggles and gets sent back down, guess what? He's going to come back up to the big leagues at some point. He yeah. just is, and it, it's almost definitely going to be this season. So most players, I think when they get called up, that, that's pressure that they already have. I mean, they know that from day one they have to perform. So I don't think there's any more pressure on Grayson right now than there would be on any other prospect getting a call up and having to make a couple spot starts. This is what teams around the league do. I mean, most teams don't prioritize player development over winning baseball games. Most teams are looking to win baseball games that season. And if a player, young prospect, has to come up and make his debut, he's got to perform. Otherwise, he's going to get sent back down. The Orioles have been in this spot where they've had the luxury of being incredibly patient with prospects and waiting on them to develop and giving them as much time as possible in the big leagues to develop and to figure things out. But the problem is, and this is a good problem to have. They want to win baseball games right now. And so Grayson Rodriguez will get another shot. He will have another opportunity if he struggles. But I don't think there's any more pressure on him to succeed right now than there would be for any other prospect. That's that's not to diminish how much pressure there is on him to come up and succeed. But all these guys face that. Taron Vavra faced that last year. Kyle Stowers faced that kind of pressure last year. Kyle Stowers last year when he was a replacement player coming up in Toronto, knew that he really had three games to open Mike Elias's and Brandon Hyde's eyes before he was going to get sent back down because the roster couldn't hold him. 
So all these guys face that kind of pressure. Sure, and, and I agree with you there, but Taron Vavra and Kyle Stowers, nothing against those two guys. They don't have the same amount of importance to this team that Grayson Rodriguez does. Certainly. And to talk about the, the pressure aspect of it a little bit in a small sample size, Hadley Rutschman's really struggled for a month. Mm -hmm. Julio Rodriguez last year really struggled for a month. Spencer Torkelson struggled for an entire year in Detroit. And then he got sent back down, didn't he? He, he did. At the very end of the year, got sent back down. But those guys, yes, they were three of the top prospects in baseball. They had a much longer leash than Grayson Rodriguez is going to presumably have right now. Because Grayson Rodriguez has a two or three start sample size to say, hey, I deserve a spot in this starting five. Bump somebody else out. Adley Rutschman got to struggle for a month and wasn't going anywhere. Julio Rodriguez got to struggle for a month and wasn't going anywhere. I don't know if Grayson Rodriguez gets this treatment here because of where the Orioles are. It's just interesting because I think that if he had made the starting rotation out of camp, he would have had that leash. He would have had two or three starts to struggle a little bit, but he would have stayed. Right. The problem is he shortened his own leash. Yes. By, by struggling in spring. And I think that's just a natural thing to for any prospect who struggles that much in spring training and who doesn't make the team when they're expected to or they're hoped that the team is hoping that they would. So, yes, I agree. I mean, I think it's... And that's assuming that the Orioles are correct in their prognosis, their diagnosis of Kyle Bradish, and that he is really only going to spend a couple starts or 15, 20 days on the injured list. It could be longer than that, and Grayson Rodriguez could have an extended stay. Another pitcher in this rotation, knock on wood, we hope it doesn't happen, could go down, and Grayson Rodriguez takes their spot in the rotation when Kyle Bradish comes back. Yeah, it's funny how quickly our conversation from last week kind of became obsolete, where we were talking about what does Grayson Rodriguez need to do in AAA yeah. to get called back up. It turns out not much because Kyle Bradish goes down, and here's Grayson Rodriguez. Well, the last two titles of our podcasts are Grayson Rodriguez optioned, and then this Grayson, one, Grayson Rodriguez, Rodriguez called promoted. back. Yeah. I, I think we all just assumed it was going to take a lot longer because he was going to need to show a whole lot longer. It's opening up a whole other kind of set of questions by having Grayson Rodriguez back in this rotation, Brendan, that probably we tabled when he was sent back down to AAA Norfolk and, and were put on hold. But I do have questions about how long he can last in starts because we saw him in spring training, couldn't get out of the fourth inning. Spring training is all about building guys up. I understand that. But if we even go all the way back, his last normal season was 2019 when he was excellent for the Orioles and Delmarva for the, for the majority of that season. Then we get 2020, no season for the minor leagues. We get 2021. They're coming off no season for the minor leagues, so the Orioles are being extra cautious with all their pitchers, and they're ramping them back up slowly, so the Orioles slow play him and never really give him an incredibly long leash, never throws 100 pitches, never even throws 90 pitches. Then 2022, the Orioles were again cautious in building up Grayson Rodriguez, if you recall. It was kind of a, a storyline through the first couple months of the season was, why is Grayson Rodriguez not allowed to throw more pitches? Uh, he had to work his way back up. He th Last time he threw 90 pitches, Brendan, August 24th, 2019. Threw more than 90 pitches, I should say. Yeah. That's a long time ago. Yeah, it is. I, I mean, last year he did have a bunch of starts in the 80 pitch range. He did, and then he had his lad injury. Right. And then he had to work his way back up slowly. And I believe, I mean, how many starts after he came back from his injury... Did he throw 80-plus pitches? Yeah. Any? He had two starts last year completing six innings. Yeah. The last time he pitched into the seventh inning was May 27th of last year. That's into the seventh inning. He's thrown more than – he's thrown – sorry, I should say six or more innings three times in the last three years. Yeah. How long can we expect Grayson Rodriguez to be out there? Today, in his next start – in 2023, in any start. I mean, you have some leeway today. You have Austin Voth and Keegan Aiken who are both seemingly ready to go today if needed. But if Grayson Rodriguez is getting called up to be your starter, you don't want him to just throw four innings. I mean, I know you need to work him back up a little bit, but Grayson Rodriguez should be able to go 
five or six innings if you're calling him up as a starting pitcher. I mean, I'm not expecting him to do a, a Kyle Gibson seven innings from last night. But if Grayson Rodriguez is your starting pitcher, the expectation should at least be five innings. And that's not really something that we've seen much from him over the last few seasons. No, I mean, a quality start requires six. Yeah. Is he going to be com- able to complete a quality start this year? I think there's a big difference between whether or not he is capable of it and whether or not we have seen it so far. The question marks are there because we just haven't really seen it from Grayson Rodriguez. Sure. There isn't really anything that would suggest to me that he's not capable of doing it. So how much do you think the Orioles will allow him to reach and get close to his pitch limit? How how much free reign will Grayson Rodriguez have to pitch late in the games? If I had to guess today, I would assume that the Orioles are hoping that Grayson Rodriguez goes five innings, 80 pitches. I think that's a realistic expectation for Grayson Rodriguez today. And then in his next start, do you say... Six, nine. Training, training wheels are off? I, I think the training wheels kind of have to be off, right? Like if, this is the the conversation that we're having at this point with the Orioles right now. The reason that Grayson Rodriguez is here is because Mike Elias believes that he gives the Orioles the best chance to win this baseball game. And if you truly believe that, then you can't really have training wheels on him. So will they allow him to throw 100 pitches if he's really dealing in his net? Probably not today. But in his next start, do you think they'll allow him to to get to 100 pitches? I know that doesn't hundreds hap- a lot. I know that doesn't happen nearly as much as it used to. I mean, yeah. 100 pitches used to be the kind of you know going rate for starting pitchers was they would typically if they were pitching fairly well they would hit 100 pitches. It just doesn't happen that much anymore. But Grayson Rodriguez, they expect and they hope can be an ace eventually. Yeah, they probably don't expect or hope he's an ace this season but an ace has to throw 100 pitches at some point sure I doubt he's gonna go 100 pitches at some point if he makes two or three starts here but yeah if if he's dealing you have to let him go 90 right you would think I mean how many did Kyle Bradish throw in that awesome start last year in August or September I'm pretty sure he came darn close to 100 that's a great question I mean, he threw eight and two-thirds innings, 10 strikeouts against the Astros. I think he topped 100. I think that's why they pulled him for that last out, and then Felix Bautista came in for, like, to to throw a couple pitches. Yeah, he threw 100 pitches on the dot against the Astros last year. So the question is, and I think they also pulled him at the end of that game, not just because of pitch count, because it was a very close game, and they just didn't want to blow it. Yeah. I just wonder if we'll see that from Grayson at all. I think it's a question. I mean, Kyle Bradish last year got up to 90 pitches in his third career game. So I could see that from Grayson Rodriguez. I think he could get up to 85, 90 pitches realistically if he's pitching well. Yeah. So how do you think he's going to do today? Going up against a, a Texas Rangers team that the Orioles have gotten the better of the last two games. Yep. Rangers swept the, the National League defending champion Phillies the first weekend of the season. It's a pretty tough lineup. I think when you consider Simeon and Seager, it's a good group. Now, it is an afternoon game after two night games, and it's a getaway game. But do you expect Grayson to, to struggle as much as DL struggled against the Rays in an afternoon game last year when he was called up to make a spot start? No. Or do you expect a better start from Grayson today? I, I think we'll get a better start from Grayson Rodriguez today. I have still seen way too much of a track record of success from Grayson Rodriguez for me to believe that whatever command issues we have seen from him so far in spring training and his first start in AAA Norfolk are going to persist. There's just, there's too many good things from Grayson Rodriguez for me to believe that all of a sudden he can't throw the ball in the strike zone. I think we're going to see Grayson Rodriguez command the zone in a better way today. He feels built for something like this. From all the conversations that we have had from Grayson Rodriguez, he seems like the kind of guy who is just going to deliver his best stuff in a big moment like this. In Texas, probably in front of a lot of friends and family as a Texas native, Grayson Rodriguez just really strikes me as the kind of pitcher and the kind of person that is going to get up for a big moment like this in a big debut. I think it's one game and anything can happen in one game. I think he could come into this game like a bunch of rookies come into their first games over-amped. We've seen him 
crush Red Bulls before games. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if the first hitter of the game, Grayson throws like a hundred a few times and it's really high and out of the zone. We yeah. saw DL Hall do the same thing in Tampa. Mm -hmm. You just get amped up and you throw as hard as you can. Absolutely. And then you settle and you're fine. And that's what I want to see from Grayson today. I want to see him be able to settle if he, if and when, he will get into trouble at some point during this game. I'm not expecting five yeah, no-hit innings. It's a good lineup, yeah. as you mentioned. It's a good lineup, and it's his first big league start. And he's playing Jacob DeGrom. Yeah, I mean, yikes. <laughs> yeah, Jacob DeGrom <laughs> is on the on the other side. Uh, Going to be tough for, for him to get the win. Although, great, the, Jacob DeGrom did not look great on opening day no. a week ago. But it's a tough assignment. It's a very tough assignment for Grayson Rodriguez in his first start. Um. Do you think there's any less pressure because it's not at home? I no. mean, if I think if the Orioles had their druthers and if, if the Orioles had to pick a day on the calendar, they kind of got to hand pick or cherry pick the day last year that Adley was going to debut. They got to line that up because they knew how long he was going to take in his rehab assignment. They weren't all that focused at that time on winning baseball games as much as they would be over the following months. They got to kind of pick when... Adley made his debut. This is because of injury. The Orioles don't really have that opportunity to pick exactly when Grayson Rodriguez is going to make his debut. I think if the Orioles had their pick, I think we would have seen Grayson start, make his first big league start around the same time this year that we saw Adley make it last year. Third Maybe. week of May in a homestand on a Friday or Saturday night when they can get ticket sales up, when they can get fan base excited, the fan base excited, and they can pick an easier team on the schedule. They I, can pick an easier opponent than the Texas Rangers. Yeah, I will say, though, I think this does still line up in a pretty cool way for Grayson Rodriguez. As I mentioned, he gets the start in Texas in front of probably a lot of friends and family. He's from Nacogdoches. Nacogdoches, Texas. Mm -hmm. And then it seems like his next start, if he gets a next start, would be at home against the Oakland A's, which is, on paper, a pretty favorable matchup if you're Grayson Rodriguez. Yeah. So this is, I think, a good two-start opportunity here for Rodriguez to put up some pretty good numbers. I think it's going to be exciting to see him pitch at Camden Yards next week as oh, well. Oh, yeah. I, I, again, in a pretty favorable matchup. My other question today, too, we're recording this podcast before the Orioles lineup is out. Is Adley Rutschman going to catch him? That's the problem, and that, and that's why I think the Orioles, if they had more time to plan this, would have been able to set up Adley Rutschman to catch him. But the problem is they had to use Adley a lot over yeah. the first week of the season. Caught a night game last night, and yeah. the Orioles play Texas in an afternoon game today. Yeah. That being said, and I think— And they have a it, game tomorrow. It's not like they have an off day. Right. That being said, I think this is a different situation than last year with D.L. Hall being caught by Robinson Chirinos in Tampa— don't want to bash Robinson Torinos. He was not a very good defensive catcher, was not a great pitch framer. Anthony Bemboom doesn't provide a ton offensively, but from everything that we have heard, it is a good catcher in terms of calling a game, is a pretty decent pitch frame. He's not Adley Rutschman defensively. He doesn't have the same kind of rapport with Grayson Rodriguez, but he's probably a better defensive catcher right now than Torinos was last year. Yes. The point being Grayson Rodriguez, even if it is Anthony Bamboom today, still set up for a bit more success than D.L. Hall was last year. And hopefully the Orioles will be able to set up Adley next week for Grayson's home debut right. to catch him because we've heard that those two are on the same page with all things that Adley yeah. knows. According to Grayson, Adley knows Grayson's stuff better than he does. So seeing those two on the field together in front of the home crowd will certainly be excited. exciting. I'm also glad that I know we've talked about how this is a short debut. It's, a, it's going to be a short, you know, performance here from Grayson Rodriguez if he's sent back down. And it's a short time frame for him to show his stuff. Audition. That's the word I was looking for. There short audition for Grayson Rodriguez. But at least it's going to be longer than D.L. Hall had last year. Yeah. Because D.L. Hall, we pretty much knew he was only going to make that one start. So I'm at least excited to see more than one start from Grayson Rodriguez. Yeah, I'm as well. And I think if Grayson Rodriguez is able to get multiple starts here, you can pretty much say that they have handled him better than the Orioles handled D.L. Hall last year. I think Michael Elias and Brandon Hyde would probably be the first ones to admit that they might have done things a little bit differently with D.L. Hall last season. Because you give him a spot start here and then try him in the bullpen, back down to AAA, back up in the bullpen. 
Dio Hall was kind of all over the place last year. And heading into the 2023 season, they are setting Hall up for more success, starting him as a starting pitcher in AAA Norfolk, working him back up there until he proves that he should be a starter at the big league level. My fingers are still crossed that if Grayson Rodriguez pitches really well at the big league level, they'll find a spot for him continuously in the big leagues, won't send him back down. But you need to handle the things here better than he did with D.L. Hall last season. I do think D.L. Hall has the chance, though, this season to reclaim a lot of the hype and uh, that high oh, prospect absolutely. status. And I'm, I am really looking forward to seeing him pitch this season in Norfolk because I do think he has the capability of shoving this year and of opening some eyes for the Orioles. I think he's going to come back better this season. I think it's interesting when we look back at this season, if we're going to, hopefully we don't look back at this season for Grayson Rodriguez and put it in a similar category that we looked back on D.L. Hall last year. Right. We don't look back on D.L. Hall's year last year as a lost season, but it certainly wasn't a step forward. Had Grace, some positives, but yeah. not as much as you would have liked. Every year that we've seen Grayson Rodriguez in the minor leagues, he's taken a step forward. And this has to be a continuous step forward here because if not, then the Orioles could be in trouble in terms of giving him opportunities, in terms of winning the starts that he is out there for. So I'm hoping that both these guys, like we've said, this is their year to take that positive step, to yep. show that they can be starters in this rotation. And it also says a lot about Grayson Rodriguez that he has been so overwhelmingly good throughout his minor league career that we are now looking at a couple of spring training starts and one start at AAA Norfolk. And these are the biggest question marks that have probably ever been raised about Grayson yes. Rodriguez since he was drafted. Yeah. That says a lot about the quality of pitcher that he is. And it also says a lot about the Orioles in general that I think we're just looking at this second series of the season and not saying these are must-win games by any stretch, but doesn't this feel like an entirely different vibe on a night-in, night-out basis watching this team oh, absolutely. than it does last year, than it does at this point last year. Yeah, we were coming into this podcast going to talk about the first series of the season in these first two games against Texas, and one of the biggest points here is that you're playing the Boston Red Sox and the Texas Rangers, two teams that have playoff aspirations, and from the jump, you were looking at these two series and going, if the Orioles are going to make the playoffs, you have to start taking two of three. Yes, I, it's the calendar just flipped to April and we're not saying they're must win games, but when you're playing two teams that are in a pretty similar tier of fringe playoff teams that are trying to make a push, trying to break into that next tier in the American league. Yeah. These are series that you have to take. Yeah. It just feels like a whole heightened awareness and a whole heightened importance because you can't series. have the April you had last year. Right. If you're the Baltimore Orioles, you can't be that far below 500 until Adley Rutschman gets called up and then things start to turn around. You need to be a solid team out of the gate if you're making a playoff. Yeah, push. so this start just feels so massive. Yeah. For, the, for Grayson Rodriguez and the Orioles, 23 years old, go get the ball, go shove in your home state in your major league debut. Yeah, and it again, we have talked about Grayson Rodriguez so much over the last few years. We were talking ad nauseum about him last year because we were just waiting for him to get the call, waiting for him to get the call, and then unfortunately the injury happens. It's weird that this has been delayed to this point. Obviously, you hoped that the injury wouldn't happen last year. You hoped that the spring training numbers would have been better. But this is still one of the best pitching prospects in all of baseball. This is still a huge stretch here for Grayson. Yeah, and the shine hasn't worn off by any stretch. Oh, not at all. But you're still hoping that he is going to shove in whatever opportunity he has here and turn into one of the better starters in the Orioles' rotation. Yeah. Because even going into the year, we hoped that Grayson Rodriguez would turn into one of the best two or three starters in this rotation this year. He didn't need him to be the ace right away, but you thought that he could have gotten up to the Kyle Bradish tier of last year, where we saw some really exciting stuff every once in a while. You were hoping that he would be a guy that you can consistently turn to, and this is where it has to start. It does. All very exciting stuff, Brendan. Whew. That has gotten me fired up to watch this game. Yeah. Orioles playing the Rangers right around 2 o'clock. I mean, Grayson Eastern. DeGrom. Grayson DeGrom is going to be. That doesn't get the needle moving for afternoon baseball. Yeah. I don't know what does. I don't know what does. Brendan, we got to go back. We've, we've had really our hands full the last couple podcasts. 
I feel the need. We have big J journalistic ethics on this podcast, Brendan. Yeah. I feel the need to go back and correct some things on our previous podcast. All right. Can I take some time at the end of this one to sure. do that? Sure. What is this? The, it's like the end of PTI when they... When they go yes, through all they the, issue all their corrections. Yeah, this is a we have to. This is an editor's note. We have to do this. Sure. Uh, we said a couple weeks ago that we didn't think that Texas had a Texas A and M line in their fight song. They do. They specifically have a line that starts with "Goodbye to Texas A and M." So we we were, you know, piling on Texas A and M for saying that Texas doesn't have the same kind of hatred towards Texas A and M that A and M does towards Texas. We're wrong. Yeah. It's in the fight song. It is in the fight song. Had to say it. Still still a little cousin, but Another that's thing. okay. We're going to move on. On the In the all 22, 2023 yeah, Orioles Yeah, this is draft, what I wanted to talk about. I cheated. You sure did. Without meaning to. I want to make Nabbit. that clear. Dang nabbit. Gosh dung it. Yeah. The, I took three players in a row, and I should have just taken two. And I specifically said, it's not your pick, Brendan. Yeah, and I, I was about you to make a pick, and you went, no, it's my pick. Look, it was low stakes. It was the very end of the draft. It if was high stakes. Back, nobody noticed. That's where the draft is won and lost. Our producer, Bobby Blanco, noticed and texted us. We missed the text. It was at the very end of the draft. And frankly, we talked about it afterwards. You would have still taken the same player with your pick. Yeah, You never know. I took Michael Givens. You took Dylan Tate. You said you would have taken Dylan Tate if you had that pick anyway. Yeah, maybe, but you didn't give me the chance, and thus, this draft will be... It's uh, null and void. It's null and void. If, if I lose, it doesn't count. If I win, it still counts. All right. I mean, I think that we've sufficiently cleared up our errors from previous podcasts. Well, that was only two. That's really not that bad. Yeah, there's probably a whole lot more that we haven't even, you know, delved into. Yeah. Well, at one point we said uh, on a previous podcast, Colton Cowser doesn't strike out that a whole lot. And boy, did he strike out a whole lot last year. Yeah, a whole bunch. I'm amazed at... at how good he was last year, despite having as many strikeouts as yeah, he did. Yeah, because his on-base percentage was still fantastic. He still walked a whole lot. He still had a good amount of homers. He still had a pretty high batting average. But yeah. He, he struck out a lot. He missed some barrels. Yeah, he still... I think the reason I said that was because he just doesn't project as a player that should strike out a lot. Because yeah. he has great swing decisions. He has a great feel for the strike zone. And I think I just kind of went, yeah, he's probably not going to strike out a whole bunch, even though his strikeout numbers are just not really reflective of the kind of approach he has at the plate. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, I saw a comment on YouTube. Are we supposed to trust Paul about pancakes after this? Look, you have a nice, delicious no. chocolate chip pancake. You go to a diner right now. You have a nice, delicious stack of pancakes. It's not chicken and pancakes. You tell me if you trust me after that. You make up your own mind on chocolate chip pancakes. I'll let the pancakes do the talking here. I don't have to defend pancakes. They defend themselves with their fluffy For somebody goodness. who claims to not have to defend pancakes, <laughs> you're defend doing a whole lot of defending pancakes to the point where in this, this is, podcast, what? you went, here's the big news of the day. It's pancakes. It's not Grayson Rodriguez. This is pro bono work that I'm defending them, okay? Sure, but I don't even have to do anything to defend waffles. You are, I mean, you are on the mountaintop screaming to the village because you have about no defense. pancakes. Because you have I no don't defense. need a defense. The waffles actually speak for themselves. I think the burden of proof is on you, Brendan, to prove oh, I the would, waffles. I think the tape would disagree. <laughs> the tape. Let's go back. Let's look at the let's, tape. Let's rewind the tape. Yeah. Um, Brendan, anything else that we should be discussing real quickly? We went to Bowie yesterday uh, and uh, talked with a couple of their top prospects. Kobe Mayo's down there. Heston Kerstad's down there. Cesar Prieto is down there. Yeah. They have some intriguing pitchers. Chase McDermott is down there. Cade Povich, Justin Armbruster. I think that this year on the farm system is going to be not discussed about as much as previous years on the Orioles farm system. But boy, is it going to be an interesting season for some of the prospects that are in Bowie right now. Yeah, I, I think Bowie is in a really interesting spot where the 2021 draft class is... I, the 2021 and 2022 draft classes are separated where you have Colton Kowser, Connor Norby, a lot of those guys up at AAA Norfolk. And then Judd Fabian, Dylan Beavers, a lot of the top guys from last year's draft class, of course, Jackson Holiday as well, not quite up to buoy yet. But yeah. there's still a lot of really interesting, fun players there. As you mentioned, you know, Cade Povich, I think, has a ton of upside, is continuing to add some velocity to his fastball. Kobe Mayo looks somehow even bigger than he looked He's last massive. year. I mean, what a just a large man. Large man. Yeah. And feels very confident about the fact that that strength will not inhibit him from playing third base, which is really exciting to hear. So I, I think it's going to be a very exciting season in Bowie. Yeah, it's it's a 
pretty loaded team, and it might be the least of all the loaded teams. I yeah. mean, you think about the amount of top prospects that are at other teams, top prospects, like you said, in Aberdeen, in Norfolk, um, and these guys have to kind of show themselves to be, you know, deserving of calls up to AAA. Yeah. On a previous podcast, also, we did predict where these guys were going to start, and I, I thought for some reason, I thought Jackson, not for some reason, I know why I thought this, Jackson Holiday, I thought was going to start in high A Aberdeen because of how long he spent in big league camp this year. He goes back down to Del Marva. Yeah, he'll probably be there for like 10 years. I think it's going to yeah, I think it's going to be like a week or two before he's back up to Aberdeen. Yeah. I mean Aberdeen has Freddie Ben Cosme already at shortstop, so maybe they don't want to crowd him right now. And we've seen the Orioles be patient when it comes to these guys when in doubt. When in doubt, send him to the lower level. Yeah. So I think once we see Jackson Holiday perform well in Delmarva, then he'll get a call up. Yeah, absolutely. One other quick note that I wanted to make as things that we probably would have discussed today had yeah. Grayson Rodriguez <laughs> yeah, not that's been the called problem. up. We're getting all these notes that we've had piled up here. This might be a future podcast, but Cedric Mullins. I mean, he's hitting the heck out of lefties right now. He is. Four hits it's exciting development. in six at-bats. I mean, he's hitting lefties better than righties. Yeah. He has two hits and 14 at-bats against right-handed pitching right now. Four hits and six at-bats against lefties. We saw it. Yesterday against Andrew Heaney, I mean, there was a, a low and away slider that Cedric Mullins just kind of protected the plate, yeah. poked it in the right field for a double. If Cedric Mullins can hit left-handed pitching, this was already an amazing player with a ton of value as a very good defensive center fielder who can steal a lot of bases and hit righties very, very well. His splits against right-handed pitching are going to come around. His splits against left-handed pitching are going to come back down to earth. But if those splits even out a little bit more and Brandon Hyde doesn't have to sit Cedric Mullins against left-handed pitching like he did last year, oh, that's a really exciting development. And he struck out three times in his first five games. If he can cut down the strikeouts just a little bit more, he struck out about 125 times each of the last two years. I mean, that's an even better player. I mean, yeah. I, I don't even think he needs to hit lefties all that well. Just strike out a, a little bit less because we see what makes what happens when he makes contact. He makes things happen. He yep. gets on base much more easily because of his speed. By the way, these new rules could not be kinder to the Orioles. I yeah, think. Jorge Mateo and Cedric Mullins are just, stealing every base. Just built for this team. It's hilarious. I mean, I, the the leads, I, I think the league will adjust. Yes. But the leads and the jumps that we are seeing Cedric Mullins and Jorge Mateo getting, I mean, it's it's almost laughable. Ryan because McKenna, there's no chance that anybody is throwing them out at second. No, it's we're seeing an incredibly high number of attempts and an incredibly high success rate around the league. Really fun. And there are a lot of teams that are benefiting, and I think the Orioles are going to be right up there. They already have been. They stole 10 bases in their first two games. First team ever to do that. Yeah, Mullins and Mateo are already leading all of baseball in stolen bases again. Yeah. And this is what we talked about in the offseason when we were talking about Jorge Mateo and how... Yeah, he might be looking over his shoulder because of Jordan Westberg and because of Joey Ortiz. Guess what? If he keeps stealing bases like this, and if he keeps hitting, if he keeps I mean, he's hitting, hitting 357 with yeah. two homers right now, then I mean, then he will be able to hold on to his spot. And if he keeps playing the great defense that he has, now he's made an error so far, one or two, I believe. Yep. Uh, but if he keeps doing that, Joey Ortiz and and Jordan Westberg will be looking for another way to get up. Yeah. This I mean, this offense is mashing. You yeah, have it's off to a great guys start. up and down the lineup with an OPS over 1,000 right now. And if Grayson Rodriguez can become a quality starting pitcher, if Kyle Gibson can keep giving the Orioles starts like he did last night, if we can see Cole Irvin and Dean Kramer bounce back. It's a dangerous team. And also, I'm glad that we're starting to see people relax about the outfield defense. The, the discourse <laughs> on Twitter about the outfield defense through the first weekend of the season. Guys, it was cold. It was the first series of the season it was windy and it was Fenway and as Austin Hayes said about the Ryan McKenna play specifically he makes that play 999 times yeah. out of a thousand I know it's a fluke it's an unfortunate fluke I don't think we'll see a worse weekend defensively I mean it would be hard because they all struggled but yeah. we will not see a, a, a as bad a weekend defensively from the outfield all season as we did that first weekend. That was an aberration, and it sucks it happened in the first weekend of the season when everybody's eyes are on this team, but that won't happen. I, I mean, I can almost guarantee, just statistically, that will not happen again because those guys are too good. Cedric Mullins was in the top 90th percentile in terms of outs above average on uh, stat cast last year. All these guys had positive defensive runs saved. McKenna, Hayes, 
Mullins, all of them were plus defensive outfielders last year. So to believe that they're suddenly going to become porous def- outfield defenders is just not going to happen. <laughs> yeah, and the last two days, the defense has been excellent. Yeah. I mean, Jorge Mateo, Ramon Arias have been as advertised on the left side of the infield. Ryan Mountcastle continues to improve at first base. Adam Frazier plays a great defensive second base. All the defensive outfielders are quality. This is a good defensive team. Absolutely. All right. Did we get through all our notes for the yeah, first week of I the mean, season? A lot of things that we had to run through we got a pretty game quickly to cover. because Grayson Rodriguez is getting the call today facing Jacob DeGrom. Yep. I mean, he's not facing Jacob DeGrom. He will be specifically. No. They will go They're never even going to share the field To start the game with a ceremonial handshake and then They both throw out the first pitch together. Right. From the mound, like a combined... They will thumb wrestle for dominance. Oh, thumb wrestle. I like that. Yeah. That's cute. Thumb war? Thumb war. Is it thumb... I declare. Well, you you would declare a thumb war, but I don't know if a a thumb wrestle is the right... Has it passed... You know, you got to get Congress to vote on it before you can declare a thumb war. That's true. You know. You can you can engage. Can we executive order that? I mean, you probably can. You know. Yeah, maybe. All right. At Brendan Morty is his Twitter handle. I am at Paul Mancano. Thanks so much for tuning in, and you can tune in each and every week. Listen to it on Spotify, on SoundCloud, on Apple Podcasts. Give us five stars. Give us a thumbs up. Please rate, review, subscribe, share this with all of your friends. We really appreciate everybody tuning in. Thanks so much to Matt Bonaparte for producing this podcast. For Brendan Mortensen, I'm Paul Mancano. Happy Grayson Rodriguez Day, everybody.